Hello everyone, this course is BUSML 70-47 Analytics for Macromarketing Data. This video is Lecture 9, Introduction to Digital Data. Before watching this lecture, please read this article, Marketing Analytics for Data-Rich Environments by Michelle Weddell and P.K. Cannon. This is a review article that introduces what we can do with rich data sets now available. The article is available at Carmen website. This lecture is different from the lectures before. In this lecture, I'm going to briefly introduce what kind of marketing data have been collected and studied, and what kind of analytic methods have been developed to investigate the data. Especially, we now live in a data-rich era due to the development of information technology for a long time, such as internet, memory storage, wireless connectivity, and mobile device. The rich data enables us to digitize, store, and analyze various consumer behaviors before and after the purchase, which have been unavailable unless we conduct a well-designed lab experiment. So, in this lecture, I'm going to introduce several examples of the studies which we couldn't do without the new data in three topics. First, word of mouth and online review. Second, online search. And third, social media and user-generated content. All right, are you ready? Then, let's get started. This is figure two in Wetherland Kanan's review article. Marketing research with data has a long history. In the 1910s, in the 1920s, companies had established commercial research departments and had attempted to gather information on markets to guide business practices. For the next decades, various early models and concepts had been developed and widely used for managerial decision making, including RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary metrics, which became central in CRM. And there was a first groundbreaking development in the 1970s. IBM's computerized point of sales, in short POS devices, and the universal product code, in short UPC. This enabled automation of data collection and allowed us to access more granular data. For example, Individual customers could be traced through loyalty cards with the POS scanners. In 1995, there was another groundbreaking development, the World Wide Web and the Internet. This development allows us to track page views and clicks, which are stored in server logs. In 1998, Google was founded and it became the champion of keyword search and search data. Through the Internet and Google, we are now able to access real data, not the well-designed lab experiment data of what happened before and after transactions, so-called digital footprints of customers. And in the 21st century, hardware development, including memory storage, wireless connectivity, GPS, and fast mobile devices, makes consumers generate data by their own, such as online product reviews, blogs video, and location. As new types of data became available, new models to analyze them followed, including Bayesian decision theory, multidimensional scaling, market share models for consumer demand, multinomial logic and conjoint method, latent class, and hierarchical base for consumer heterogeneity, and structural models for predictions of shifts in behaviors when policy changes are implemented. Then, let's talk about what we've learned in this course. Frankly speaking, we learned only one model and only one method, log log demand model and linear regression. Oh, the regression was first introduced the 1930s in the figure of the history and lots of methods have been developed. Hmm, then the regression. Isn't it too old? But not really. The log log demand model and linear regression still serve a main method to understand and analyze the data. 
Of course, those analytic models and methods allow for more accurate and more granular analysis. But the model or method itself cannot create new information. Data has the new information. And the log log demand models and linear regression are fair enough to navigate the data to extract the new information. Then, now let's dive into the studies that extracted the new information from the new data. Here we see some of the studies using a log log demand model or its variant with a regression method. The first topic is word of mouth and online review. I'm going to introduce these three articles using online conversations to study word of mouth communication by Dave Godes and Dina Maislin, the effect of word of mouth on sales, online book reviews by Judith Chevalier and Dina Maislin, and sentence based text analysis for customer reviews by Joachim Bushken and Greg Allenby. The first article by Golders and Maislin focuses on the word of mouth communication. We now know very well how word of mouth is important for product success. People are influenced by others' opinions and sometimes people are hurting, although it may not be the optimal behavior. Word of mouth has unique characteristics. Its impact depends on who is talking. This is natural, right? In all human beings, there always exist opinion leaders whose impact is much greater than others. And extremely dissatisfied and satisfied customers are most likely to engage in word of mouth. This implies that word of mouth may generate new sales, but the sales also affect creation of new word of mouth. That is, the effect of word of mouth may be endogenous, not exogenous. But most of all, word of mouth is an interpersonal communication different from the firm's communications. That is, it is very, very hard to observe word of mouth. So, this article addresses the following such questions. How to gather the data of word of mouth? And what aspect of word of mouth conversations should be measured? The article addresses these questions with consideration of indigeneity of word of mouth. The author's solution is as follows. They suggest online conversations as a proxy of word of mouth. So, to show it works, they collected a historical archive of user conversations in Usenet news groups and applied the data to TV show viewership in the United States. This is a screenshot of one of Usenet news group. It looks like RSS news feeds. There are lots of groups by main topics. And in each group, people post their thoughts and opinions, and the post is shared with all people who signed up in real time. Of course, this may not be representative of all conversations about a product or service. We have a lot of conversations face to face over the phone and through direct messages, as well as on the communities like the news groups. But the online conversations may reflect, at least partially, the offline conversations. So here is the list of the variables in this study. First, viewership, which is denoted rating. It is the main dependent variable, and each lagged variable is used as an independent variable that captures people who continued watching the next episode because they had started watching the previous episode. And the authors test various measures of the volume of word of mouth conversations. It is naturally expected that the more the buzz, the higher the viewership. The simplest way to measure the volume is counting the posts about each TV show. This is denoted post. In addition, to consider the valence effect or the effect of the tone of the post, the authors count positive posts, negative posts, and mixed posts separately. Also, to control for the quality of the post, the authors count the words in each post. Usually, the longer the post, the higher the quality. 
Another type of measures is dispersion. It is about how many types or groups of people had conversations about the show. If conversations about the show are found across various groups, the TV show is highly likely to be popular. If conversations are found only in one or two groups, the TV show is highly likely to be not popular or a cult. The authors suggest an entropy measure, which basically builds upon the number of groups where the posts appear about each TV show. In addition, there could be a natural increase or decrease in viewership over time, so the authors add the episode number as an independent variable. If each coefficient is estimated to be positive, there would be a natural increase in viewership over time. If negative, there would be a decrease in viewership over time. And this is the basic model. It is a regression with fixed effects. There are two subscripts. Subscript I for TV show and subscript T for time. The unit of time in this data is the episode. Then, rating IT indicates the viewership of TV show I's episode T. The basic model includes the lag of the viewership, the volume of the post, the entropy, of the post, the episode number for the time trend, and the fixed effect of the TV shows in analysis. The authors also investigated various versions and extensions with the other variables. Through a series of analysis, the authors found that online conversations may offer an easy and cost-effective opportunity to measure the word of mouth and dispersion of conversations instead of volume of conversations as explanatory power for TV viewership model. And the dispersion effect declines over time. The idea of using online data of user opinion sounds cool, and the next article addresses the impact of online user reviews. Chevalier and Maislin collected data from two leading online booksellers, Amazon.com and BarnesandNobles.com. They used the differences in differences method with multi-period observations of about 2,400 books to investigate the effect of consumer reviews on firm sales patterns. This is a quick summary of data. Basically, there is sales information, price and sales. The authors use sales ranking variable instead of actual sales amount because of unavailability of the firm's proprietary data. Next, the authors count reviews for each book to capture the volume effect. And for the valence effect, the authors use the user's evaluation. As you observe frequently in Amazon reviews, you just leave 5-point scale evaluation. Average star indicates the average evaluation by the users, and fraction of 5 star and 1 star reviews are separately considered to control for additional effect of extremes. This is the model used in the study. The authors use the differences in differences method for log log demand model. Amazon and Barnes and Noble may be different from each other in terms of sales level, users, and so on. So there could be a lot of fixed effects of books, stores, and book and store pairs. Each of the stores, Amazon denoted superscript A, and Barnes and Noble denoted superscript B has its own equation. In each equation, log of book I the ranking is regressed on the fixed effect of book store pair, denoted mu, the fixed effect of books, denoted nu, the log price at each store, and the variables about the reviews, and additional sales feature variables such as shipping time. So, the main variable we need to look at is this x in each equation, denote the set of the review-related variables. 
with a limited number of observations, it is hard to identify all of the fixed effects. So the authors use differences in differences technique to cancel out the fixed effect. The differences in differences technique allows for reducing the number of coefficients to be estimated by cancelling out the fixed effect. Thus, the third equation, which is the equation actually estimated, looks like complicated. We can interpret the estimated coefficients in the same manner for a log-log demand model. From the estimation research, the authors found that reviews have a positive effect on relative sales. If a book's reviews is improved, an increase in relative sales is observed. For most samples, extremely bad reviews have a greater impact on sales than extremely good reviews. However, at the moment when the authors conducted this study, there were no technological development enough to digitize the review text data. The next article addresses this issue. What about the content in review text? Consumer reviews contain text about consumer experiences with products and services. In the early of the 2010s, computer scientists developed a mathematical model to analyze text data, which is called LDA, Latent Dirichlet Allocation Model. This model allows for inferences about the latent topics in text data. Bushkin and Allenby the authors of this article focused on the structure of sentences in a text review. In a text review, people talk about multiple features of a product or service. In LDA modeling, each feature is called a topic. So, in a text review, people usually talk about multiple topics. But, each sentence of a review is usually related to only one of the topics. The authors propose sentence constraint LDA model, which is an extension of LDA model to handle this sentence topic relationship, and apply the proposed model to Expedia.com and we there.com reviews. This displays an example of sentence topic relationship in a review. The color coding in the display is present to identify different potential topics which are seen to change across sentences but not within sentences. For example, sentences describing breakfast are coded green and sentences describing general experience are coded blue. This figure graphically represents the basic structure of the original LDA model. Let D denote a document and D and n denote the word in the document. Then, the nth word appearing in document d, which is denoted wdn, is thought to be generated by the following steps. First, a topic for the word is chosen, which is denoted zdn, and then an appropriate word is chosen given the topic. In this model, it is allowed that each word can be related to its own topic. But, Bushkin and Allenby constrain the words in a sentence to be related to the same topic. This figure is the graphical illustration of sentence constrained LDA model, where another subscript S is introduced. This denotes a sentence, so the nth word appearing in the S sentence in document D is thought to be generated based on a topic chosen for the sentence, not the word. The proposed model is applied to online review text data. This table displays top 30 words for each topic extracted from Expedia mid-scale hotel reviews. Those topics are labeled by the researchers based on the highly related words. For example, the model just informs that the first topic is highly related to the words in the first column. Some words are repeated in the other topics, but most words are strongly related to noise and smell in a room. So, the first topic is labeled noise and smell. 
The authors also fit the same data to the original IDA model, where multiple topics can be allowed in a sentence. However, the result supports that a sentence in a review pertains to one topic, while the review is comprised of multiple topics. In addition, LDA models, including SCLD model, are in a class of unsupervised machine learning algorithms. The research from the LDA and SCLDA models can be a good complement of the independent variables in the review response analysis, such as Chevalier and Majorlin's study.